back to the workbook, I'm on page seven. You'll notice that everything is labeled here for you. I wanna make sure that you get the story down. So make sure you review this. Now, the next thing we're gonna go into, the next topic is cardiac conduction. All right, so let's see, what are we talking about here? So cardiac conduction is, remember all this stuff about blood flow. In order for the heart to, to contract, so what we have to separate is, for instance, the electrical situation from the mechanical. When we're talking about the contraction of the heart and, and what aids in blood flow, that's all mechanical. So that's like the heart is a pump and the, the pump does its job. So that's the mechanical action of the pump. However, in order for the pump to work, it has to receive power, right? That's what we're gonna talk about next, which is the cardiac conduction. This is how does the heart generate electricity? So let me get back to the screen. All right, so pop me back on the screen. All right, thank you. So cardiac conduction. What we're talking about is how does the heart receive electricity? Let me just go back to this little drawing I did earlier. I said that every cell has three Every cell in the body has at least three cycles. Every cell starts off at rest, and then it depolarizes, then it repolarizes, right? That's every cell. However, with muscle cells, we have to have these other sets where it also has rest, it still has to depolarize, but then it has to contract. And then it repolarizes, okay? What we were just talking about with the blood flow part is the contraction part. But in, in order for it to contract, it first has to depolarize. Now, what am I saying here? Let me just break, actually, we're gonna cover that. Uh, yeah, we're gonna cover that a little further. So let me just keep going for now and then I'll get into the physiology that's coming up also in today's lesson. When it comes to the cardiac conduction, what we're saying is how does the heart receive power to do its job? How does the heart receive electricity to do its job? So here's the big picture of cardiac conduction. We have these specialized cells in the heart that are called pacemakers, okay? So all muscles are able to contract smooth. By the way, we have three types of muscles. What are they? Smooth muscle, cardiac muscle in the heart, and then skeletal muscle is what's on the, on the limbs, for instance. Skeletal muscles are what are allow us to be able to, for instance, move our arms, our legs, our extremities. Smooth muscles line the blood vessels, they line the GI tract, the respiratory tract. We have smooth muscles throughout the body. But then in cardiac muscle, cardiac muscle is the unique type of muscle, the unique tissue type that has its ability to generate its own impulse okay, on its own without having to receive a signal, for instance, from a nerve. Most muscles, all right, so let's draw this out for a second. So most of the time, in order for, let's say this is a muscle, in order for a muscle to work, first it has to be innervated, for instance, by a nerve, okay? So a signal has, the nerve has to get activated, and then, for instance, within the nerve, Neurotransmitters have to, uh, let's, let's move this over a little bit. Let's, uh, let me create a little space here. Okay, so what normally has to happen is neurotransmitters have to be released from, for instance, this um, presynaptic vesicle into this space. This space here is called the neuromuscular junction, right? Or the synapse. So what happens is, for instance, let's say something like um, norepi. Let's say on the, on the sympathetic side, norepi would get released into this neuromuscular junction, and now a signal gets activated at this motor end plate, and now the muscle gets further activated. Now, and there's a whole set of physiology that's involved in muscle contraction. And so I'm not even going into that just yet, but just know I'm going to just generically say it's calcium, but there are a whole lot of steps, for instance, from, from calcium binding at these sarco... All right, this is just bonus. Stay with me for a minute. All right, this is just to give you a break. So for instance, muscle contraction, that's what I'm talking about now. In order for a muscle to contract, 
calcium has to, remember how calcium or the neurotransmitter got released from the, hey, let's put that back on the screen. The neurotransmitter got released from the vesicle here. It, it got released into the synapse. It activates this motor end plate, and then it's, it sends a whole bunch of signals throughout the muscle, and then eventually the muscle contracts. Well, this all this stuff that happens through here is where, for instance, calcium binds to the calcium binds to the membrane of the muscle, the sarcolemma, and then it um, gets released. It activates the um, uh, dihydropyridine, which is a protein there. It act it uh, causes a conformational change there, changes the shape of it. It travels along the T-tubules, T-tubules, uh, activates the, um, I'm drawing a blank, the, uh, oh, ryanidine receptor, and then it gets released. So we have this whole situation of calcium-induced calcium release, then calcium binds to troponin, or it binds to specifically troponin C of the tropomyosin complex. That's where actin and myosin interact, cause a power stroke, and then that causes contraction, right? So that's a whole lot of steps. That's a whole lot of stuff. And that that's going to take a little more time to go into than I have today. But in the mastermind, I'll cover that in greater detail. But basically, I want you to know that the way muscles contract is because of calcium. Okay, can we just, can we go with that for now? The way muscles contract is because of calcium. In fact, what makes the muscle contract is where calcium goes into the cell. But what makes the muscle relax is where ATP comes along, adenosine triphosphate, for instance, right? Well, this is why when someone dies and they, they have calcium that went into the cell, but because they died, the mitochondria are no longer able to make ATP. The muscle is not able to relax. So this is what actually causes that stiffening of the body that we know as rigor mortis that happens hours after death. It's just because calcium went in and caused the muscle to contract, but there was no ATP to cause muscle, the muscles to relax. Okay, That's just a little extra to tie it all in together. Back to this part, though, when it comes to, so all I just explained was the muscle contraction, and that is the part of blood flow. But in order for the muscle to be able to contract, the muscle has to get excited first, and that's the depolarization part, okay? So I said that most cells in the body or most muscles have to be innervated by a nerve first, and then that's what allows the muscle to get activated and contract. The cardiac tissue, on the other hand, is able to kind of bypass that whole process and generate its own impulse within the heart itself. That situation is known as automaticity. So what we're saying is the heart is a, has specialized pacemakers within it that's able to generate its own impulse. Now, the reason for that is there again, we're trying to maintain cardiac output. You don't want to have to go through an extra step when you need to run from a bear and you need your heart to pump really quickly. All right. So that's where we're going to get into. Let's get back to it. When it comes to this first picture here, so I'm on page eight of your workbook. This picture I want to draw your attention to. We're going to use this one picture over and over and over again. So every single day, you're going to see this one picture come up. The reason for this is... The reason I use pictures so much is, number one, it's the best way for you to learn, okay? Think about it. The brain thinks in terms of pictures. Like when you dream, you dream in pictures. You don't dream in words, right? If I say right now, think about your front door of your house. You actually picture the door. You didn't see the words or the letters F-R-O-N-T-D-O-O-R, if I say, think about your car, you think about the vehicle itself. You're not thinking about the letter C-A-R. Well, it's the way the brain works. We think in terms of pictures. The other reason you see me draw so many pictures is I want you to understand how to, I want you to understand the information for yourself, and then I want you to know how to explain it to your patients, okay? Think about the next time you do something to a patient. You should never just do something to a patient. 
without explaining what you're doing. Well, one of the best ways to explain things to a patient is to simply draw a picture. In my two-decade career in healthcare, I have drawn a lot of pictures. For instance, when I was on an ambulance, when I was on a helicopter as a flight paramedic, um, throughout my journey in medical school, when I'm working in the emergency room, I always would keep a Sharpie on me in my pocket or in my flight suit or whatever I was wearing. And I would draw, for instance, on a bed sheet, on a paper towel. I'd go over to the window and start drawing. I would just draw all the time. <laughs> in fact, I did this so much that I I designed my own little flip chart, a spiral bound little pocket sized notebook. Sorry about that. I designed, I'm <laughs> getting excited over here. I designed my own little flip chart of medical illustrations. In fact, I'm thinking about just releasing that so that other people could use it because it has pictures of the heart, it has pictures of the lungs, the kidneys, the uterus. I mean, it has like whole body parts that I've drawn because I kept having to draw the same pictures. So I said, you know what? Why don't I have like a spiral bound laminated pocket sized notebook that you could just explain things through pictures and you're able to, you could use like a Sharpie or a grease pencil and then you can take like an alcohol wipe or one of those cavi wipes at the hospital and just wipe it off and, and just keep reusing it over and over. So if that's something you may be interested in, let me know and I'll tell you how to get that. And maybe we can make that available. That, that would be cool. So take the time, though, to draw pictures for your patients. It, it will help you help a lot because what happens is you talk to a patient and you say, OK, you understand? <laughs> and what they do, they shake their head like 17 times. No, they don't understand. If they shake their head that many times, they don't understand. One of the best things that you can do, in addition to drawing pictures for your patient, is say, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to explain this to you, but I want you to pay attention because I'm going to ask you to repeat it back to me. So you will tell them, and then you're going to ask them, what did you say? And then have them tell it back. So it's that whole ask, tell, ask situation. Okay? All right. Let's get back to it. When it comes to cardiac conduction, we have these, the chief pacemaker is called the SA node. It's known as sinoatrial node, okay? Now, this SA node is situated in the, so let's label this. This is the right atrium. So the SA node is situated high in the, in the right atrium, and it's along the back wall, Okay. So it's superior posterior, okay? So it's high toward the back of the right atrium. That's where the SA node is located, okay? Now the SA node, and I'll get to the, the rates next, but the SA node, first the signal lands on the SA node, and that's in the right atrium. But we don't want just the cells in the atria to get excited. So what happens is we need these, sig we need these cells all throughout the atrium to get depolarized, to get excited at the same time. Well, how does this work? So let me draw out like some cells here, okay? So let's say I'm in the right atrium and I need this signal to spread to the left atrium and I need it to happen quickly. See, I don't want just one cell and then the next cell and then the next cell happening or getting excited one at a time. I need it to happen like a wave very quickly. Well, that's exactly what happens. When we were designed, we were so intricately designed that there are these gap junctions between the cells, and that's what allows this wave of depolarization to spread through rapidly. And it allows all of those cells to kind of receive an impulse about the same time, okay? Now, why is that important, though? There again, if one cell had to depolarize at a time and we have hundreds of thousands of cells there, it would take a long time for all that muscle to get excited, to depolarize, and then be able to contract. You would die before then. <laughs> you wouldn't have enough cardiac output. So that's why those gap junctions are there, is to allow that wave to happen quickly. Now, when I say depolarization, what am I talking about? Depolarization is the flow of positive charge into a cell. So at rest, let's go back to this, this uh, example here. Remember how I said, and this is going to come up soon, 
first the cells are at rest, then they have to depolarize, and then they repolarize. Except in muscles, they're at rest, they depolarize, they contract, and then they repolarize. So this first part is all cells, and this next part is muscles. Okay? Well, this depolarization part, all we're saying is that the inside of the cell becomes very positive. What is depolarization again? It's where the inside of the cell becomes more positive. Okay? At first, at rest, the, cell, the inside of the cell is very negative. Then it becomes more positive, and then it has to become negative again. Everybody good with that part? All right, so let's get back to it. So in order for all of these cells to become more positive or depolarize, first the impulse lands on the SA node, and then it travels from the right atrium to the left atrium through what's known as the Bachmann's bundle. So this portion here is the Bachmann's bundle. But then the SA node says, hey, I need it to go to this next pacemaker. I need to pass off the signal to the next guy in charge. That next person in charge is the AV node. The next pacemaker is the AV node. The AV node is also situated in the right atrium, but it's close to this inner ventricular septum. Okay? So there again, we said the SA node is situated high, so superior, and toward the back, so posterior, so supero-posterior in the right atrium. The AV node is much lower down. It's what's called inferomedial. So infero toward the bottom, medial toward the middle. It's inferomedial in the right atrium no, near the interventricular septum. Everybody good with that? So the signal goes from the SA node to the AV node through what are known as the internodal pathways. Let me get a drink really quickly. Do you have your, your level up medic water bottle yet? If not, make sure you get that. <laughs> All right, so let's recap that. Signal goes from the SA node, spreads along the from the right atrium to the left atrium through the Bachmann's bundle. It goes from the SA node to the AV node through the internodal pathways. Okay, from there, so the only thing that's happened at this point is the, the atria were sitting at rest. Then they got depolarized. Now what happens is once they get depolarized, once the cells become more positive, they can then contract. So depolarization has to happen before contraction. Now once, once the atria contract, so we're at this step where the atria are contracting. While they're contracting, we need we don't want the ventricles to get excited too fast and start contracting at the same time. We don't want the atria and the ventricles to contract at the same time because now blood is not moving, right? Because valves have to close when, when they contract. So we can't, if we contract the atria and the ventricle at the same time, there's no blood flow, okay? Actually, there's that's there's a word for that that's called isovolumetric contraction. It's where there's a pressure buildup, but there's no blood flow because all the valves are closed at that moment. And so we can't have that in order for blood flow to happen. So what has to happen though, is while the atria are contracting, the AV node receives a signal and then it has to pause for a second to allow blood to go from the atria down into the ventricles. Okay, then the signal, and, and this is all, all going to tie into the EKG. And this is why there are certain periods of the EKG. So for instance, we have, let's put, pop me back on the screen. Okay, so we have a P wave. Then we have a PR segment. So first the atria are at rest. Then the atria depolarize. That's the P wave. Then the atria have to contract. That's the PR segment. Remember, that was a question from the quiz today. Okay? And then the atria repolarize. Except we don't actually see that portion on the EKG because it's overshadowed by the ventricles. And then what happens is the ventricles start at rest. So this is 
during the period of atrial contractions, atria, atrial contraction, the ventricles are at rest. Then the ventricles depolarize, and that would be the QRS. Then the ventricles contract, that's the ST segment, and then the ventricles repolarize, that's the T wave, okay? And we're going to get into all of that even further tomorrow in day two. For now, all I want you to know is just this cardiac conduction piece. So let's get back to this. So the signal was at the AV node, and then the next part is it goes through what's known as the, let's, let's highlight just that part, that's the bundle of hiss. Say it with me, bundle of hiss. From there, we need the ventricles to get excited. So what's going to happen next is the signal travels from the bundle of hiss, and it travels down these bundle branches, okay? So on the left side, we have what's called a left bundle branch. On the right side, we have what's known as a right bundle branch. Now, in order to, for that signal to get throughout the full thickness of the ventricle, we need some extra help, and that's going to be through these things called Purkinje fibers. So we have Purkinje fibers that aid in the rest of the signal going throughout the ventricle so that the whole muscle can contract together. So let's go back over that. We have an SA node. The signal goes from the right atrium to the left atrium through the Bachmann's bundle. From the SA node to the AV node, the signal travels along the internodal pathways. From the AV node, it pauses for just a moment to allow the blood to get, uh, allow to, the atria to contract for blood to go from the atria down to the ventricles. The signal then goes, it travels along the bundle of Hiss to the left bundle branch in the Purkinje's and the right bundle branch in the Purkinje's. Now, go to page nine in your workbook. What we notice, so this is just the conduction part that's pulled away from the heart itself. What we notice is, remember I said how it goes from the bundle, the bundle of Hiss and the left bundle branch and the right bundle branch, I'm sorry, the left bundle branch and then the right bundle branch. What we know though is the left bundle branch is actually divided into two separate fascicles. There's a, there's a fascicle in the front and a fascicle in the back. The one in the front is called the anterior fascicle the one in the back is known as the posterior fascicle. Now, let me tell you about that. So this anterior fascicle of the left bundle branch, the anterior fascicle receives blood from the left coronary artery, okay? The posterior fascicle receives blood from the right coronary artery. Now, why would you care? Why do you care about what, supplies each fascicle? Well, great question. <laughs> Let me tell you. You ready? The reason that's so important is, for instance, let's say you have a heart attack. Let's say a patient's having a heart attack. Well, the right side of the heart receives blood from through the right coronary artery. The left side receives blood through the left coronary artery. For instance, the left coronary branches into the left anterior descending, the left circumflex, and so forth. The right coronary branches into, for instance, you've got the right marginal, the diagonal, um, and then there are different branches off of it, like the SA nodal branch and the AV nodal branch are branches off the right coronary artery. Well, so for instance, pop me back up on the screen, please. Thank you. So in the, let's say somebody has an, a blockage to their right coronary artery that supplies blood to the right side of the heart. Well, that same blood vessel also supplies blood to the posterior fascicle of the left bundle. So for instance, they could have, they could now have a, an obstructed blood flow that wipes out this fascicle. So what it means is the back part of the heart doesn't receive any, any stimulus, right? Or, for instance, what if we have a blockage in the left coronary artery? It could now affect the anterior fascicle of the left bundle. So either blood vessel can also affect a left bundle branch, or it could cause a left bundle branch block. 
So this is why in the setting of a of an MI, one of the things we want to rule out, for instance, is a new onset left bundle branch block. That's why it's so important to know this. Does that make sense? So you may have heard people say, well, okay, you need to rule out a left bundle branch block, but but why? Well, that's what I'm explaining. Depending on the blood vessel, it can affect either the anterior fascicle of the left bundle branch or the posterior fascicle of the left bundle branch. But either way, the left bundle branch can be affected, okay? Make sure you know this. So let's just, here's just a simplified drawing without all the labels. So I want you to know we have an SA node, we have a Bachman's bundle, we have internodal pathways, an AV node, a bundle of His, we have a right bundle branch in Purkinje's, we have a, uh, this is bundle of His, we have a left bundle branch, also we have the Purkinje's, but remember that the, the left bundle is broken down into two fascicles. We have an anterior fascicle and we have a posterior fascicle. The anterior fascicle is supplied by the left coronary artery, and then the posterior fascicle is supplied by the right coronary artery, okay? Any questions on that? So that was cardiac conduction. Now, I also have a picture on page 11 of all of this kind of labeled out for you. Just make sure you go back over this. And I definitely encourage you to watch these videos more than once. Tell your friends about it. Tell your friends all that you're learning, for instance. This is just day one of the EKG Mastery Challenge, and we've got so much more to get to.